Hello, 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 hello. It's good to see you. Say hello. Welcome to the Husky Hockey Podcast. And, you know, Andrew, I'm going to do something a little bit different here just to kick off this show. We're going we're gonna to hop in the okay. Wayback Machine. All right. That's, yep. uh, Getting nope. in the DeLorean. That wasn't Wayback Machine. That wasn't Rocky and Bullwinkle, right? That was Peabody and Sherman, right? That was the Wayback Machine. That Let's go. Let's go with it. <laughs> All right. That's. So, so we're going to go back, and I'm, I'm going to throw out a name, and you just give me the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay? Okay. Jeff Frazee. <laughs> what comes to your mind uh, when well, you hear Jeff Frazee? Oh, well, obviously, I know the what evoked that memory. <laughs> uh, and it evoked that for me as well. Uh, let's say the... Um, I think it was Brett Borgen that's that scored the goal on him in St. Cloud. Yep. But I'm gonna more think the uh, the Lucia uh, death stare, the death stare, uh, which <laughs> it sent him to hockey's equivalent of Siberia, um, because he never saw another minute. Well, I, I it, the Borgen one might have been because I was at that game. If you yep, remember, I was at that game too. They scored. They scored one from half ice or whatever it was. Yeah, Borgen scored from about half very, ice. Yeah. Okay, and then someone else scored right at the end of the first period, but it was a little too late. I think that was like a second yep, after the buzzer. I think that was Stevenson. I think that was Matt Stevenson. Okay, I I, I knew Borgen was involved in one of those. Yep. Um and and yeah, uh, and w- w- was that Kangas? That was. Or- Patterson? That was Kangas. So that was like his launching point. Yeah, that was his. He he was a starter for like two years plus Mm -hmm. after that. Which I, because of all of this, it, it, you know, I I think in our first iteration of the podcast, when Mm -hmm. we brought up Frazee and we were in the Wayback Machine again, and you were talking about how he didn't see another minute of ice after that. And that kind of blew my mind at the time. I totally forgot about that. That was his last college hockey memory was that Lucia death stare as they're crossing up. That death stare was so harsh. Nowadays, it'd be a protocol violation because everybody could sense in the building what, what the issue was. And that was, a, that was even a goal that didn't count because it came after the whistle. Um, I think just, they like reviewed it too. It was, yeah. it was close. Yeah. Okay. Another probably half second, and it would have counted. Mm-hmm. Yep. And I always thought that in the short aftermath of that, I was thinking, okay, he's going to like transfer to Anchorage and, and end his college career there. But no, it, it that was just it. Yeah, I don't know if we ever if he ever played a minute of hockey period after that. For all I know, uh, it was quite the uh, quite the turn uh, for Mister Frazee there. So I looked at uh, Kangas's stats for that year. He's a good guy. I mean, he played very well against the Huskies. Huskies yeah. struggled to beat him. Yeah. Um, I think there was only one person who really could score consistently against Kangas, and I think that might have been Garrett Rowe. It would have been right there, because I think of that next year, that was what the 07, 08 year, the Crazies last stand. And I think it was the next year after that, the 08 09 year, I think is when the Gophers beat him six times. They played him in the playoffs as well. I think they went 6 0 against him. And it, I'm sure I would be willing to bet at least that Kangas got all six wins uh, in that series. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah, Frazee didn't. I bet yeah, either didn't. it was either Row or Lash that scored the most of them because that's who was scoring most of St. Cloud's goals in those years. I mean, that's true. I think it was Row because I want to say. Him and Kangas had some history. Like, I think they both played at in the USHL on the same team. Junior. So, yeah. Something like that. Exactly. Yeah. So I think they, like, I think, and then I think Garrett Rowe had some kind of a 
jab at him in the paper like I know how to beat him or something like that. It was it was kind of because I think they both played for Indiana. I want to say at the same okay. time, so it's like yeah, but I know what we'll, he's we'll go with it. Anyway, that that's yeah. the story I'm going to go with. And Garrett Rowe, please uh, let us know and correct me if I'm wrong. And please do. So anyway, that year Kangas had a 930 save percentage and a 1.98 goals against according to collegehockeystats.net. His yeah, record his record 12 10 and 9. Like I couldn't Yeah, it was a weird fathom weird era for, for the I golfers couldn't there. Fathom having those good of numbers and that record. Like how frustrating must have that been for for Gophers. Would have been on sort of the tail end of defensive domination in hockey. You know, this isn't too too far away from the Wisconsin Brian Elliott sort of two to one, one nothing games. Yeah. So maybe it was I, I would be willing to bet that the average goals against that year was like a half goal or better like than this year. Uh, across the board, just because I think scoring is up now in in in, in this era, mm-hmm. so maybe the stats didn't set him apart as much as it would today. But sure. Still, whatever area you're in, sub two goals against is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, exactly. So, and obviously, the whole reason you know this all really started with um, North Dakota against Minnesota. And Robbie right. Bina scored from pretty much the same spot where Brendan Bushy was. Um, from what I remember, Borgens was more in mid ice. Borgens was actually but, like more, like I would say, halfway between the blue line and center ice. Like it was, it was one you should have stopped, and it was far off in the neutral zone. In the neutral zone, right. yeah. But yeah, Bushy's was from. I just checked. I. My memory was it was a little bit closer to his own blue line, but no, it was right about at the dots. Yeah, it was at the dots, which is where Robbie Bino was. So what is that? 120 or 180, 180 feet? I would say, yeah. Probably, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So well, one one hop ground ground ball past shortstop. Yeah, you know, exactly. It's a home run, home run in the uh, in the box score. It gets by Buckner. You know, it uh, <sighs> it happens. So behind the bag, <laughs> it gets through Buckner. <laughs> so. Um, anyway, uh, maybe a little bit of bearing the lead here. Uh, Huskies sweep Colorado college and over at, uh, Robson arena and, um, you know, first game three to one final and, uh, second game was a little more of a boat race boop, boop, trouncing by the Huskies uh, of, of, a uh, five rip. So, um, just uh, overall, kind of, what were your thoughts on the games, uh, the series, and uh, how the Huskies played? Good weekend, as we mentioned last weekend. Uh, you know, we would have been we would have been frustrated with anything short of six points. And that Friday game was 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 dicey at times, defensive struggle, uh, and but Huskies were able to. Pull it out in the end, uh, in, in ugly win, but a win nonetheless. That Saturday game, pretty, cl- pretty clear. You know, five minutes in, I just had a good feeling about that one. Af- after they scored the first goal, it's kind of like a floodgate situation, mm-hmm. and getting three in the first period to Chase and Barico, I thought played good on on Friday. Um, yeah, not not counting the the one hopper, um, but. Uh, Chasing him and really, I mean, after the second goal, it was just like, yeah, how ma- how many are they going to get? Was really the only question. Yeah, just a dom- dominating performance. A-, a good example of a game where shots on goal can be a deceiving stat. I mean, I, I was surprised to look at the end of the game and see that CC had the shot advantage. Yeah, I mean, there's no point in that game that's that San Claude was not in complete control of that game. So, if you want to get a good read on a hockey team or a hockey game just looking at the shots on goal isn't going to do the trick at least in, in this case it, it wasn't because it didn't it didn't paint the picture uh that that St. Claude was really in control 
So that was good to see. It's, uh, you know, CC, I mean, better from a defensive uh, standpoint in years past, like on that Friday game especially. You know, St. Cloud historically really had their, their way with, Saint, with uh, CC, especially in Saint, uh, Colorado Springs. Lots of lopsided affairs in St. Cloud's favor. Uh, and CC was able to tighten that up on Friday. I thought played a, a good, good defensive game. St. Cloud was limited in their chances. Uh, and Iberico, I thought, played, like I said, strong, save for the one sort of bad goal that he gives up. And, uh, you know, it needed to step up there at the end. I mean, the first two goals, the, the, the goal for St. Cloud, the bushy goal, and then the goal that CC scored, basically put in by the Huskies, the only goal that St. Cloud gives up on the weekend. Uh, and so you kind of wash those two out. Not, not great goals either way. And well, they were both just, just kind of lucky bounces. And so it's it kind of evened itself out that way. I mean, Bushies hits, you know, puck kind of on end. And then uh, Roseboro diving, trying to break up the pass, ends up deflecting into his own net. So, I mean, both of those were just kind of lucky balances, even himself up. And uh, that's I, I how I viewed that is like, OK, we got one. You got one. Who's going to step up and really take the reins in this third period for the Huskies? Okay. And it uh, good offensive push there from the Miller line. Scrub in the net, loose puck. And it's uh, Dylan Amherst um, who steps up at the end. Uh, and, and they needed someone to step up, and Amherst it was, uh, and uh, really needed, really needed that one, and uh, icing it with a with an empty netter late in the game. <laughs> Amherst from is Zach, right. from, from Zach OKB. Um, I, I'm just I'm I'm going by what the professional uh, PA announcer was saying. You know, good games from very minimum, and um, I actually did think that uh, Kendron Yami. Did play very well. He was very apparent to me on Saturday. Yami played a good game. Kendron, Yami, that is. Played a good game. Um, and so it was a good weekend in the Springs. And a continued domination of this team helped me out on this one. So, it, by my count, 17-game win, uh, uh, unbeaten streak for the Huskies in Colorado Springs. 16-0-1. The one game being a tie and a CC win in a shootout in February 2020. We're not counting that towards the streak, though, are we? We're not counting a shootout win as tainting a 17-game unbeaten streak for the Huskies. Because it's, you know, it's a pairwise tie. CHN lists it as a tie in their schedule uh, results from that year. So I'm going to go with it. Have not lost a real game. A, a full loss in CC since February of 2013. That's in the WCHA days. So, yeah, get that. This streak that the Huskies have of, of dominance in Colorado Springs spans two conferences, uh, three CC coaches, two St. Cloud coaches, uh, three U.S. presidents. <laughs> you can have a lot of fun there with what, you know, if it was February 2013, that would have meant that it spanned my entire time on Twitter. So I got my Twitter account in like October of 2013 and then ended it a few years later. So in that entire span, my Twitter presence uh, arose and died. Lots of, time, lots of things have changed in, in the last you know, nine plus years. One thing hasn't changed, though. St. Cloud has never lost a real loss in CC <laughs> since that time. And I went back to that uh, box score in, in 2013. Yeah, had some fun. You know, Brodzinski had a couple of goals. Ryan Farragher, just th some of the names. I did get a chuckle, though. The two officials, Marco Hunt and Derek Shepard. Back-to-back -back <laughs> weeks now for both of those uh, refs to get a reference on this podcast. So I know we're in the way back machine. We're, we're taking the DeLorean back Oops. here again yep. to two. To the old WCHA days. Let's get the TARDIS out. But good, yep, good old Marco Hunt. Well, we get up to a 2 nothing lead. Uh, score two goals in, what is that, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10 seconds? Apart. Brodzinski and Prochno. 
in the first. CC scores about four minutes later, and then in the third period, they scored three state straight. Ah, that, that's frustrating all over again. And that was in their old building, too. So it's, it spanned a couple of different CC arenas. Two arenas? Yeah. So. Oh, nice. But as getting back to this weekend, a good weekend of hockey. Like I said, just the one goal allowed in the two games, and that one directly off the stick of Rosborough. So great goaltending, I thought, by the two goaltenders. CC kind of helped him out offensively. I, they they reminded me offensively. They sort of remind me of Wisconsin. Um, not a good comparison if if you're a college <laughs> hockey team. Um, but in that, you never they, want to be compared they, to Wisconsin. Ne- Current never Wisconsin, never a good idea. Who did survive Lindenwood? So it did survive just barely. <laughs> Even uh, scored on their own that. net. That happened also in the Western Duluth Duluth game. game well. It was a weird, weird, weird I, goals were scored on Wisconsin, that Friday. <laughs> Wisconsin had that happen. I don't know if it was it, it. It happened in the Gopher Wisconsin game last year. I can't remember which team put it in their own net. That used to be like a once a decade play, and now we're thinking of three in the last year that it's happened. So I'm hoping that never happens to St. Cloud. I've never seen that happen in either. I can't direction remember if it was last year Huskies. or two years ago, but I do remember because I want to say Cole Caulfield was out on the ice for that. I, I, I know that it was last year against the Gophers. Cause I was watching it here. With oh, my dad. gotcha. Um, it may have happened before it, it, we're talking Wisconsin. So <laughs> it's definitely in the, in the realm of possibility that it's happened on a yearly basis there. That's true especially lately, but uh, where were we? Uh, own goals here. It, it's distracted me here. Oh, yeah, CC's, yeah. Uh, CC's offensive pressure sort of reminded me of Wisconsin in that, you know, they were generating some chances, but a lot of times they would help the Huskies out by effing it up on their end. And, uh, and Caster, I thought played great. Uh, obviously Bassey with a shutout second of the year. On Saturday, uh, in his revenge tour of goaltender of the week, NCHC goaltender of the week, Bassy was. Mm -hmm. Feels like Caster just he's probably sitting there going, "The hell do we got to do here?" (laughs) I I mean, I know his stats aren't as good, and I was the guy last week saying that Bassy should have started both (laughs) of his games, but not give a ton up to Quinnipiac. (laughs) Back past uh, history, I guess is is his big. uh, Sorry, that, up, that was you know, that was that, that, that was board. unfair considering how well he's been doing this year. Yeah, no, and so you know, CC tightened the game up defensively on Friday, not so much Saturday, but on this year, they seem better in, in that area of the game. But just they they need some scoring. I mean, they were fortunate last week to get some points out of Miami, get five points out of Miami, just scoring what three goals on the weekend. Mm-hmm total in the, in the two games. Uh, uh, I, I don't really see a ton of improvement from this CC club. I think a is a good goaltender. I mean, he plays a little loose, you know, he's that, that, that I, the winner on Saturday was another play. He, he lost his stick a couple of times in the game. There's one sequence where he like lost his glove or his blocker too. Yeah. It was able to recover and make a save. So he, he seems like an active uh, goaltender in that regard, like he's he's willing to to move around and make some you know risky plays and you know, selling out to make saves. So I think he'll be able to steal you some wins. Um, you know he's better goaltender than well, I was going to say maybe maybe not. I was going to say better goaltender than what they've had in the past, but the one they had last year, at least one of them, Bassey, is <laughs> is now uh, aces for St. Cloud. Uh, so, but I think he's, he's a decent uh, goal, goalie for him. And yeah, I mean, I, we just keep hearing that Mayotte is this uh, recruiting whiz and thinking that they should improve. I mean, who knows though? I mean, that, that Saturday game reminded me of some of those other games, the games that I attended there in the Springs, nine to three, seven to one, six to one, just reminded me of those kind of boat race games where, uh, it was a men versus boys, uh, sort of uh, sort of game. So good to see the Huskies take care of business against a team that they should have. Um, that Friday game, like I said, was a little, uh, a little hairy and I was getting a little nervous there, but uh, 
were able to pull it out and and now you get a you get a week off before you hit uh, North Dakota or at least host them the week after so it's uh good to get the break here rest up it's been a good first what seven eight weeks seven weeks I suppose but uh, you still got 20 games left and then the playoffs you've you've set yourself up here well for success though Mm -hmm. and I think that keep it rocking and yeah so two thumbs up for this weekend uh, from me this past weekend for the Huskies yeah it was you know Friday game, uh, Brand was out both games, um, so it got a little bit of a chance yeah. for, uh, you know, some of the freshmen to kind of get in and, and get acclimated. Um, you know, watching that Friday's game as it was unfolding, I, I never got a sense of panic from the Huskies. Uh, you know, we go up ahead on the fluky goal, they get a fluky goal back, but it, you know, all throughout this season, when we've had these kind of tight chances, I felt like somebody was able to step up. And this time it was uh, Dylan Anhorn, who, um, you know, kind of, there was that little bit of a scrum, jumped up a little bit. And, you know, if you look at the replay, it was actually like a little bit of a slight hesitation to get the defender to bite a little bit more. Um to get a little bit of a better angle and get, uh, you know, just a heck of a shot to, to get us up late in the third. And then once we got that, I'm like, okay, well, I don't see Colorado College scoring because our defense has been so impeccable this season. And I thought on Friday, and then it continued on the Saturday, that Colorado College just doesn't have the offensive output. I, I I just don't see it. So it's in seeing that we were able to kind of, yeah, maybe it was a little bit tighter than it normally should have been or whatnot. Uh, you know, Okabe gets the empty netter uh, to have the Huskies cover because the spread was one and a half. So that's uh, always nice. a good sign when you're able to cover. And it's, but I never like it just, it was like they just kind of, they stuck to their game plan. They kind of continued. And uh, they were able to uh, end up with the victory. Uh, I was happy with, you know, Dylan Anhorn's goal because, you know, again, that was chaos. That was a little bit of a scrum in front of the net. The puck popped out and we were able to capitalize on it. And even in the the uh, Saturday game, too, there were a couple of other instances where we weren't doing kind of the normal things that we're used to seeing. You know, I could think of like Crookshank's goal on the power play. You know, lately we've been trying to just feed Mietnin on the wing for the one timer. And I thought on Friday we kept doing that. I think we had two power play chances like back to back and on on Friday's game early on. And I was just like we kept trying to do that play. And Emberko was standing there waiting for Mietnin to shoot. It was so easily predictable. And I was like, You gotta change it up. You gotta do something. Ingram Still with his behind the back passes is a little bit worrisome, but uh, it ended yeah. up working out with uh, uh, with him over the weekend. So, but just going back to that, um, how well that defense played. Um, l- looking at it top to bottom, th- this is as good as the defensive just depth as we've had in an incredibly long time. Obviously, what you have eighteen, nineteen. I think that kind of stands out as uh, you know a heck of a defensive. But I, I think this just is more defensively sound. There's no, I mean, even the people who are rotating in with Reiners and uh, Zemer and um, oh my god, Riley. What? Yeah, like I think all 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 of them are. It doesn't matter who we're throwing out there. I mean, we have a captain who is out for this series who has been a stalwart defensively. And we just picked up like nothing happened. (laughs) It was, it was, it was awesome to see. And I've, I'm starting to turn the corner on this team. And I think I just have to get out of that mentality of, you know, 
the outscoring type of running gun type thing, like, oh, where's our depth? Where are our forward lines? And look at it, maybe, I hate to say it, more like a Minnesota Duluth in those championship years where we're able to really limit these chances and limit them and just be that stalwart defensive team that is able to capitalize on these chances. And I think that's going to pay dividends a little bit more in the long run. And, you know, because when that offense cools, we saw it with Botsko. Yeah, that that's when you get that um you don't know how to win another way. And this team so far has been able to find different ways to kind of get it done. And it's I I hate to like say though a series against Colorado College is the one that's really gonna get me on the bandwagon, but it was it, it was a very encouraging sign to see and goaltenders did great and I can't rave more about how well this defense played, uh both Friday and Saturday. No, I agree. Uh, not to get too ahead of ourselves, but I do. I did get a shout out to a defenseman this week for a player of the week for a pal. So, so I I do agree with the defense. My my caveat is, I think CC's offense helped a little bit in, uh, making that defensive effort look so good. Um, but I still, can see that this isn't just a one. This is isn't just a one series observation here. I think this has been a season long trend. A Larson long trend. I, I think Larson's MO is a, as a defenseman or as a defensive kind of style of coach. That was at least his kind of reputation coming from Duluth, as you mentioned. Uh, those the first uh, the, the first of the back to back titles that that he was insistent on. So um, that's not surprising, and and it is like you said, Meyer being out, but guys having to step out. I don't even think I don't think Reiner's played this weekend. But he's no. played well uh, in in his action this year. I I, uh, I, I wonder Zemer. if they were going to get him in that Saturday game, but I don't think you could have taken Zemer out. I thought Zemer was phenomenal for a guy who sees limited action. Um, yeah. I thought he was physical at times. I thought he made incredible plays with the puck. You know, that's that's a lot of points that it takes for a guy who is in and out of the lineup, really to no fault of his own. Yeah, and I guess let's 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 name them all here because I mean Pert, a guy that we've uh, had some issues with over the his tenure yeah. so far. I thought he had a really good been, series. Been I cleaning thought. it up, and and you can you can see the sort of player that he's developing into. He was the player that showed us sort of that raw talent last year. He's a he's a puck handler. He's a natural puck handler. A, a natural sort of quarterback type uh, on the power play and an offensive minded defenseman. And he's cleaning up the sloppiness, uh, I think. And yeah, I think by the, maybe even by the end of this year, maybe even sooner than that, he's going to have fully for fully formed into that. Mm -hmm. And so it's it going to be exciting to see the full development of him. If, if St. Cloud gets that version of him, because if, if that happens soon, uh, watch out. Uh, also, Trey Ball, a guy that we seem to always forget. He seems to be the forgotten man in this defensive core, but a guy that just rarely makes mistakes. Um, it's easy to kind of forget about him because he, he rarely shows up on the score sheet, but he rarely shows up in your mind as, oh, Trey Ball it was the guy that blew the coverage there. That doesn't happen too often, mm -hmm. and that was another sort of representative weekend for him in that regard. Um, and Josh Lutke getting his first goal of the season on Saturday, uh, tipped in by the CC player, I believe, the second goal on on Saturday. But uh, you know, he's a he's a guy cut in that uh, Peart uh, mold, got an offensive uh, mindset to his game, and you know, obviously coming off that that concussion, sent him up for a month. Right at the beginning of the season, he's showed no real ill effects of that. Playing physical, playing aggressive, um, but also not playing stupid either. So, yeah, this entire uh, defensive core is really stepping up. And, and as you mentioned, you know, the other question we've had, aside from goaltending too, is depth of scoring. Well, we, we, get, we get the fourth line on the score sheet right off the bat on Saturday with Rodgers getting his first goal, tipped from a bushy shot. Uh, Pierre also getting a, an assist there. And, you know, the Spal I thought Spalacy played pretty good mm -hmm. this weekend. Yep. 
Um, you know, Rosborough had that play on Friday where tips the uh, the puck in, obviously inadvertently, and I think that's a play that he can be coached into avoiding in the future. But but I think he, he's a guy that plays assertively as well. He's he's not playing timid. That's that's not a play that a timid player makes. That's a player that's trying to go out of his way to make a a good play, and uh, that's not something that is necessarily a bad thing. It's just the it's just obviously the result was not good, but um, but I like the effort on it. Let's say, yep. and, uh, and and he's a guy that's only gotten a handful of games this year, but he's playing, showing that he wants to stick in this lineup too. So even kind of the bottom six shows up this weekend too. Even though I did think, especially on Saturday, that that uh, Ranella, what are we calling him, uh, Kendron Yami, <laughs> uh, that line was was excellent. Uh, I, I thought uh, Okabe with three goals on the weekend one of those being an empty netter, but, uh, but uh, he obviously was all over the score sheet. They were able to get, you know, last week you're talking about cleaning up on, on odd man breaks. You know, there was a couple of two on one yep. type plays. One of them, they, it was with the, well, Okabe kind of cleans up the rebound on a two on one. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the, but it was still part of the two on one play in the, the aftermath of that. Well, and, and then I believe this. I mean, Miettinen had that shot, but I think Miettinen was yeah. looking to pass it to Okabe, but just didn't have the angle. So I thought Miettinen was like, okay, I'm going to ring it off his pad. And sure enough, that's what happened. And Okabe was there just to clean it up and then paid the price for it by getting checked into the crossbar. Right. Yes, he did. But, and so, yeah, I, I hesitate to take too much out of this because, uh, you know, CC is still kind of CC. But going into this weekend, this is what good teams do. But, you know, it's a, it's a road series. You had to face some adversity on, on Friday night. You played through it. And you showed CC who's boss on Saturday, uh, really with a game where, you know, like I said, after the first five minutes, it was not in doubt who was going to win that game. So this is a, a series that, you know, tournament Which... teams, they make this kind of statement. Full disclosure, I uh, actually, because that game kind of got out of hand, I did uh, have my tablet set up and one eye on the uh, Wayne State, uh, St. Cloud State uh, volleyball match that was going on because they were in the tournament. So I was watching a little bit of that, which St. Cloud won. But then, oh, wow. Yeah. But they lost in the round of 16 to. Concordia St. Paul, who they beat in the uh, NSIC championship. So that was kind of a bummer. But but anyway, so really just quick divergent here. So shout out to the uh, women's uh, women's volleyball. Of course, it's women's volleyball. <laughs> shout out to the volleyball team for St. Cloud State for having just a heck of a season, heck of a run. But um, yeah. Yeah. I, I did not know that. I, I wish I would have been uh, alerted to that. Oh. I, I, I like me some volleyball. I, I love watching volleyball. Volleyball is so fun. It's so tense. I think it's, it can be like some of the most intriguing ten. It's like, I think it's, I think it's like football on steroids when it comes to in the intensity. Cause like. There's some football that has steroids in it though. So maybe that's not the, the best. Um, Fair enough. Analogy. Fair enough. That's a good point. I don't know, but just but, uh, like, when, kind when, of the start and stop nature of. Oh, volleyball no, is a lot more intense than the start and stop nature of football. That's the point that I was trying to get at. After one of the uh, Omaha trips, we went to a bar that's uh, that was close to the CenturyLink right downtown. Place was packed. This was after the Omaha game, so this would have been you know nine ten o'clock. We're just like, why is this place full to the gills? It was a large bar too. Uh, it was packed for the uh, um, Nebraska volleyball game in like the NCAA tournament. I'm going to say it must have been somewhere on the West Coast, so that's why it was like a late game. Mm. But like the entire bar was was there cheering on, and I don't even care what's the sport in a scenario like that. But volleyball, I like it. I like anyway. I, I like volleyball in itself, but it's very easy to get hooked onto yeah. the action if you got the entire bar sort of <laughs> behind it yeah. so it was really fun just kind of watching watching uh nebraska volleyball uh that that one 
random night back in what 2014 or 15 or whatever it was. So yeah, I yeah I go Huskies woo. I, yeah, I'm sorry I missed the the tournament run. Anyway, what were we talking about? I think we're talking about hockey. Hockey. All right. I think so. I was just looking here, see. looking at the stats, and I'm kind of surprised to see actually Zemer's been in ten games so far this year. I would have, I would have gone less than that. But anyway, I'm gonna say that sounds that sounds right. You know, I'm I'm gonna trust the stat. I, I guess there. <laughs> There was a couple of games where it seemed like Reiners had sort of taken over for him. I, I think he got both of the games in Denver uh, mm-hmm. and maybe the Bemidji series as well. I do remember there was a game where, where Zemer, maybe it was the first Bemidji game, maybe that Zemer didn't look very good. And that could have opened the door for Reiners for, for some extended action. But And I'm sure we're, we haven't seen the end of Reiners. Yeah. Obviously haven't seen the end of guys like uh, Meyer and... Um and Wiley too. Um, so uh, yeah, it's the, the fact that he got more than enough uh, capable defensemen here. It's a good problem to have. Yeah, only change um, uh, was that uh, Molinar, uh, who played on sa- on Friday, didn't get uh, didn't dress on Saturday. Got switched out for all coin. Um, but like you said, I mean the depth against the CC squad, we did what we needed to do. Um, this was six points that were needed to kind of keep pace with really, I mean, Denver, <laughs> um, they're kind of running away with things right now and really have a incredibly soft schedule here coming up until they, I mean, you can make the argument with how North Dakota's playing, but I won't get into that yet. Um, but it's, um, it's, a, it, it's, a it, it was a good weekend to just be like, hey, here's here's what we need to do and able to pass with flying colors. So I'm 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 getting more and more on board with this team and um, goaltenders again. They played excellent. I think it was just it was just a solid week all around. So you're saying you're giving your Go Huskies woo player of the weekend. You're giving it to a defenseman. I'm giving it to a defenseman. I'm going to be shocked if we all three have the same defenseman, but let's see. Go ahead with your pick. Yeah, and it's not based on the goal because I don't think that was obviously the best goal in the world. But oh my gosh, even without that, I was going to give it to Bushy. We are all going to give it to Bushy, aren't we? <laughs> That's awesome. And I did, I did have to think. Yeah, you know, I, I had to think about it because you know, obviously Okabe was on Okabe. my mind. Cronulla, uh, I think, was had, on my mind. Cronulla had, I think, four assists on the weekend. Who? Oh, yeah, Kendron. Kendron, Yami. Kendron yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I thought he was he was very good, but I feel like, you know, I feel like I've given, I know I've given Okabe, I think Okabe was my player of the weekend last weekend. Was he not? Or no, Crookshank was. Crookshank had another good weekend. Yep. I mean, coming back to CC, getting that nice snipe goal. Getting that nice snipe, and then uh, also the emotion of his celebration. I thought was really interesting. Like it was, you could tell it meant a lot to him to score against his old team. So I, yeah. I, I found that kind of interesting that he would, uh, that he cranked that celebration, I think up to 11 on that one. I, I guess I didn't see if, if Bassey did a uh, lawnmower pull uh, after the, the final buzzer on, on Saturday, who, but who did make some but, excellent but, saves in the third period. Yeah. But bet you that one was especially sweet. Yeah. Sweeter than I'd say that from Crookshank's perspective of like I think there was more potential uh animosity mm-hmm. with, with Bassey because I think there was the argument that he was kind of pushed out with Embarico coming there. Whereas I think Crookshank kinda of left on his own volition. And he was getting top six minutes there when he yeah. was with St. C.C. So yeah, I don't, it's not even like when, when Crookshank went to the Gophers, got buried in the line chart there. I don't think he had the same sort of possible resentments towards C.C., but I think Bassey might have had a chip on the shoulder. And so I'm sure that that uh, uh, felt pretty good to not only get the shutout, but, you know, they chased Embarico after one on Saturday in that game. So 
uh, nice game for Dom. Uh, nice game for for all the boys. Did you want to say anything particular about Bushy? I mean, we had the we had the the one hopper that we've said, mm-hmm. um, and also starting that play on Saturday, the first goal, he gets the shot that is tipped in by Rogers. So a guy that's generally not an offensive minded guy, even early in the year, I was kind of. Uh, not a huge fan of him trying to make too much offense out of his game. He's better just as a stay at home defenseman, but he brought that this weekend. I think that's his trademark. And, um, you know, with Meyer out, he's kind of the elder statesman on, on the blue line, uh, during Meyer's injury, maybe a de facto captain of that unit, uh, with, with Meyer, uh, sideline for now. So, uh, I, I do think that he's a guy that, that the other, especially younger defensemen, uh, can learn from and and I think that showed through. Um, he's uh, he, he's a good solid player yep. and and just like the I, I could have given it to Ludke, I could have given it to Peart, could have given it to Anhorn, yeah, you know, any you know uh, Amherst, could have given it to <laughs> any of these any of these guys and uh, and it would have been I would have been singing a lot of the same praises here so. This uh, defensive unit definitely does deserve the plaudits that it's uh, that we're throwing it right now, and hope they keep it up. Yeah, and I also want to point out there was one big quote unquote say block shot that Bushy had in Friday's game too. Yeah, um, yeah, that that really kept uh, you know kept St. Cloud. The one is still tied. Yeah, I believe. Yep, it was tied. It was still tied at that point, but he made you know just really sacrificed his body. And I think it's funny because that's that's Go Huskies woo. That's his pick as well. Um, is Bushy? He did get also defenseman of the week. Uh, Bushy did, did so. Um, yeah. And I thought I was actually going to be a little bit alone on this one because there were so many good choices that we could have picked. Um, and the fact that all three of us kind of came to the same conclusion, and maybe for me also it was a little bit of when am I going to give it to Bushy because he's right. not going to be that standout guy a lot, but. He definitely deserves some praise, um, you know, and kind of in the same line as Trable, who deserves some praise, too, because I thought that Trable Zemer pairing, I thought that was excellent all weekend. I like I mean, we talked about how Peart probably had his best weekend and talking about how Bushy is a little more of that stay at home. Peart, maybe a little more run and gun. You can have that kind of a nice balance there between the two. So, yeah, it's. Again, we got this off weekend coming up. Uh, Meyer gets some rest. <clears throat> Who do you sit? Like, where where do you go? I'm. I, I feel yeah, like I said, uh, good problem to have, yeah. and and you know that'll be worked out with between the players in the practices with the coaching staff. It it. it it helps to create a good atmosphere here, I think, because it's a con- competition between the guys, a friendly one, obviously, but they're going to have to step up their game in order to impress uh, the people that they, that, that need to be impressed in order to pencil their name in the lineup. Yep. And so I, and when you, ha- when Wiley and Reiners and Zemer and these guys, the guys that are the candidates to sit, I mean, Meyer is going to play every game that he's healthy. Mm-hmm. Bushy, Trayball, uh, these are going to be the guys that are going to be playing every game. But for the fringier guys, uh, expect when they are in the lineup to take that opportunity and make the most of it. Uh, that's what we've been seeing so far, and I, I don't see any reason to doubt that that's going to be the case going forward. So I, I like that, how that... Uh, instills a bit of uh, competition between the players. And I think the same is true for that you know, bottom six forward set, which we do see a, a fair amount of, of cycling through different players there. Uh, it's similar there where it's like, you know, okay, Rogers scores his first goal. You know, now that, that that's another sort of bar for guys like a coin and Rosborough to sort of, they got to clear that bar now. And, Hopefully that is a good thing for this team and a good thing for the chemistry too, that they're accepting the fact that they may not be in the lineup every, every game, but not that don't take it personally, but, but give it, you know, take it as a, as a, 
motivation and also to support the the teammates that are are in the lineup for that game. So I, I like it, and it, it seems to be working. And you can't have enough, especially defensemen. You can't have enough good defensemen. So uh, yeah, I can't say enough about how well this unit has has, has performed so far. Um. You know, Dylan Anhorn right now tied for second amongst defensemen in scoring with 15 points uh, on the year in 14 games. Uh, Only uh, one ahead is uh, from North Dakota, who we'll see um, not this coming, but the following, uh, Chris Jander. So he's got 16 points. Really? So, yeah, 15 um, tied here with Jackson Lacombe from Minnesota. So that's kind of where he's sitting at nationally. one one more thing, kind of, I want to put a pin in uh, for this, um, you know, CC series, and it was just I felt like Saint Cloud, like we stayed on our toes, but we were able to anticipate the play a little bit more, you know, when we we were able to always, you know, we weren't really caught out of position very often. We were in, able to really kind of dictate the play, but also know what CC was going to try to do. And we were able to counter that. And and, uh, that kind of foresight gave me a lot of good energy throughout the series and really how I'm feeling about this team. And as I'm kind of shaping my mind, I'm really starting to believe that uh, this this team has the structure to do some really good things here throughout the rest of the season. So I'm 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 all in, and I'm I'm really enjoying the ride so far. Yeah, are you? Uh, where where is your you know my, my my husky meter percentage meter? Let's put it at like eighty five, eighty seven percent. I mean, you had mentioned a question that we had. I was sort of doing the math as well. I mean. So this is 11 wins right now for the Huskies. They've got, as I said, they've got 20 regular season games left, guaranteed at least two more in the first round of the playoffs. So 22 uh, games at a minimum until selection Sunday. Um, Yeah, just going 11 and 11, let's say, even though there was going to be ties and overtime results mixed in there. But if you just go 500, you're at 22 wins. We can go I think a pretty... 6, 8, 2, 4, 1, and 4. <laughs> or, or whatever. And that might get you in. I mean, as I mentioned, the NCHC not being as strong this year, you know, last year, what was the Huskies' final record? They didn't win 20 games last year, I don't believe. Um, and that was... Largely attributable, yeah, 18, 15, and 4. That's counting the Quinnipiac game. So 18, 14, and 4 in the regular season. You're not going to be, I don't think you're going to be able to get into the tournament with a record like that in this year's NCHC. No. Because you, you had five teams get in from the conference last year. So just the, the strength of schedule is just jacked up much more. I mean, look at Duluth coming into the, was it the coming into the playoffs that they still had the opportunity to fall under 500 yeah they could or at least it was the last it was at least the last season or last series of the year right before the playoffs yeah, series. so that was that was my dream that they'd be wisconsin Dell. right right and and not only that you know but they win the playoff series then win the tournament uh, and then get a the fifth overall seed in the, in the tournament you know two weeks from being right basically a 500 team so you're not going to have the the luxury of being 18, 14, and four and being pairwise solid. But right now, let's just say you go 11 and 11, that puts you at 22 and 14. That's probably going to be good enough. Doesn't really even matter how the wins are split up between the Miamis of the world versus the Denver's or the North Dakotas of the world. That'll probably be enough. Um, if you just, you know, you, you, t- you win four games against Miami, you win two against CC and then he split against everybody else, you know, that's going to be 24, 25 wins. You're probably, you might be like looking at a high two or maybe even a low one seed there. So I do think that this, at this point, it would probably take a pretty sizable collapse for the Huskies to, to, to miss the NCAAs. 
which I don't maybe that's maybe I'm too early to that or maybe that's just the pairwise is flawed because the you can say that 14 games into a 34 game regular season and be this confident that the Huskies are going to make the tournament just based on math. Maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Uh, I'm fairly confident that they're going to make the tournament. Like I said, it would have to take a lot of losses here and to some unexpected opponents. I want that on um, a t-shirt of, I may be wrong, but I don't think I am. Like I like that Huskies line. logo. Yeah, right. Exactly. Our Huskies hockey podcast logo that we definitely have. But so you have my my take. What what what's your take on it? Like well, you you've been sort of bearish on this team, or or let's say not bearish, but Tepid. hesitant to <laughs> to fully commit yes. to this team. Like, well, where are you, where are you feeling? What are you feeling? Right I mean, now? maybe if you were to say I was at sixty percent before this weekend. You know, yeah, I'm I'm closer to 89 <laughs> now. Wow. So I've a 30 up. point jump, 30 point over jump C- over a CC due to a CC sweep. That, sweep. I know. I'm I'm going I'm going Pete Rose head first here in into all of this. <laughs> B- bowling into Ray Fossey. Yep, exactly. Right now, that's good. So that's good. Um, anyway, how this kind of you know for one of the questions go huskies woo asked you know just kind of also breaking down that math about that you know 22 games left in the, in the selection even if we go about 500 um you know it's hard to think that we're not already in uh, barring any sort of doll stall which um you know it was kind of a uh, defining times of uh, uh Craig Dolls you know, last few years here where we'd have a solid beginning of the season and things just kind of went off the rails. So, um, and yeah, that's, you know, maybe it's a flaw, maybe it's a bug, maybe it's a feature of the pairwise that you can be this confident. Um, you know, we have a good enough, I think, out of conference schedule, um, where we're able to play solid teams. Um, and get solid results. Got solid results against Mankato. Were, were we though? I mean, it's really just Mankato right now. I mean, Bemidji's like mid twenties, uh, and that might be kind of where they end up. I don't expect them to be much better than that. And then you have the Gophers. That series hasn't been played yet, so I guess, and that probably will be fine for yeah. their strength schedule. Just having the Gopher and the Mankato series because they're both those are both probably tournament teams. But you know. St. Thomas, that series isn't going to help you. The Wisconsin series is not going to help you very much. Bemidji, um, you lost one of those. So, well, we get those comparisons it, against Lindenwood. So, I mean, that's going to be... It's true. That, that, yeah, and, and this is a murderer's row non-conference schedule compared to something like, I don't know, Penn State. Exactly. Um, or or you know, someone like that. So, yeah, not complaining. Uh, and But, yeah, and... I hope that's not their mindset. Like, hey, we can just take it easy and play 500 the rest of the way. No, let, let's let's hit the pedal of the metal here. Uh, and you got an opportunity. Like, North Dakota is sitting out there. I'm talking about being frustrated that we're not going to get Duluth here when they kind of look to be primed uh, for a beatdown. Look at North Dakota right now. Yeah, Just losing to Miami. Uh, you know, them coming to St. Cloud has been just a, basically a guaranteed split for decades now. Like, would we? You know, it's close to my birthday. the The weekend would be the weekend after the Miami series, I suppose. But how about we get an early birthday treat here for Andrew and, and sweep the the green, right? Uh, the green bastards. Uh, that would be great. And not only because it's sweeping North Dakota, but it's North Dakota's again not been very impressive this year. I mean, I guess that's the question. Who's been the bigger dud this year in the conference, Dakota or Duluth? Because they've Ooh, both been pretty duddy. That's that's a good one. Um, I think Duluth has looked worse. Yeah, but I think Dakota had the, Dakota had the higher expectations. I think. But yeah, over overall nationally, yes, I was a lot more bullish on. Duluth than most. Uh, Duluth, yeah. And so to see them struggle as much, I thought they'd just score more. 
Um, and, you know, obviously now coming off a weekend where they were able to, you know, kind of put some points up on the board against Western Michigan. But before that, it's it's been like a vortex for them to try to get – it's like pulling teeth. I think they averaged before this last weekend like 2.07 goals per game. Um, and I thought, you know, they had some really good recruits coming in, and maybe they just – haven't found it i mean and to be fair it's it's tough to adjust i mean ingram is still kind of adjusting right now and right um and uh, he's going to be i I still think he's going to be a solid player so i'm not too concerned about it but it's it's tough to kind of jump into this league um so um yeah and you know also remember that we're we do play denver again so i mean that's um, that's definitely going to help our um you know, as far as our pairwise goes, but you know, as long as we're talking about this and, and by the way, you know, I have been king of the, let's not talk about pairwise, you know, you know, we don't talk about pairwise and at just everywhere on my Twitter feed, I've decided I'm just going to go with it now. I'm not going to be happy about it, but I'm going to stop moaning about it and just kind of, I'm just going to be a salmon, just kind of laying there as the stream just washes over me and I'm just going to go with the flow. So fine, I'll talk well, about pairwise. You know, we're less than a week away from our magical date of Thanksgiving. Uh, after Thanksgiving, it's we that that's the date that we my magic my magical date was always New Year's. That was always mine okay. because then you would get another round, usually of some holiday tournament or some more non conference games. You know, the Gopher series I think is what the seventh and the eighth of January. So. Yes. It's a little bit later, but you know that's what that was always well, mine yeah. is when the non-conference games. Ends. I agree, but it probably is the best because you, you need to get the majority of the non-conference, and you get a lot, of, a lot of non-conference this weekend, mm-hmm. and then you get a lot of non-conference end of the calendar year, like New Year's weekend. Yep. Last year we did the thing. I think the first weekend in January, where we picked the field. I think we should do that again, and let's do that at the same time. Okay. But, yeah, about the pairwise, the thing you got to know is just, it, there's a lot more um, seismic jumps based on wins this time of year. You know, you, you can win a game. You can win a big game. I believe Minnesota came into this Michigan series where they swept Michigan. I think Minnesota was 13, 14, somewhere in there, and now they're up to three. Big seismic jump. If that series was the last Big Ten series of the year, they would have jumped, but it might have been two or three spots rather than ten. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you have like a, a I think a Minnesota or a Minnesota Duluth. I think they jumped up maybe ten points after they beat Western on Friday, and then they fell back five or six points or five or six spots after they lost on Saturday. After the beginning of the year, the new year those fluctuations are much more muted. You, you only maybe move up two or three spots at most during the weekend. And even I, that's kind of the thing where people get frustrated later in the year with pairwise, where it's like, Oh, St. Cloud beat the number one team in pairwise. We only moved up one. Yeah. Like what the hell? Like, well, that's the thing. The more data points that the computer gets, the la- the more tame the results are and the the movement of the pairwise is much less uh you know jumpy later in the season so conversely it's more jumpy early in the season so again if you look at your team and boy why did we drop 12 spots when we got a win and a or a loss and a tie just give it some time you've only played eight games maybe you know so just give it some time and 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 that's, you just got to factor that in. And that's where people, I think, kind of forget about what actually the pairwise is. And it's actually like a one-to-one comparison of you against one other team. Here are some factors that determine whether or not you beat the comparison. So one win or one loss may flip comparisons against five or six teams, which is why you're able to jump so high. And that's why, like you saying later in the season, when you beat a top ranked team or anything like that, that might not flip a lot of pairwise comparisons because, you know, common opponents record may still be in somebody else's favor or, 
you know, um, anything else, you know, can kind of factor into that as well. So that, that, that's where, you know, pairwise is more than just the RPI. And obviously that's the bigger aspect of it, but you know, it, it's, it's, it's really that pairwise wins of other teams on a one-to-one basis. Do you beat them in these three categories? And that's where I think the, uh, the non-conference can really affect that because you're not playing as as much, you're playing the majority of your schedule against your conference opponents. So when you're having the comparisons against teams that are not in your conference, those are reliant on smaller samples. Like the big 10, for instance, St. Cloud's going to play four games against the big 10 this year. They've already gone two and zero against Wisconsin, and they're going to play two more games against the Gophers. So when you're comparing St. Cloud to like, uh, let's say Michigan or Penn state or Michigan state or anybody else in the big 10, a big factor of how you're, matching up with those teams is how you do in those common opponent games. Cause they're obviously going to be playing Minnesota and Wisconsin as well. If you can go four and oh, in those games, St. Cloud can win all four of those. They already won the two against Wisconsin. Let's say they sweep the Gophers. They're going to be sitting really good when compared to the other big 10 schools, because anything less than also running the table against Minnesota and Wisconsin you're going to win. You're going to at least have a good chance of jumping a team like Penn State based on winning the common opponent uh, criterion. So that's why I think the more non conference action, once that is settled, and by the end of the year, end of the calendar year, end of 2022, the majority of that is going to be over. Mm-hmm. So that's why I do think that, yeah, getting back to your January 1st metric as being the real kind of this is when pairwise is legit to look at still agree with that. But you know, like I said, the, the CHN guys seem to think that, and they've done some digging data and, and all that, that by the time that Thanksgiving rolls around, you know, the field is for the most part, like 90% set. Uh, so I guess I'll trust them on that. And yeah, if you want to look at it, just keep in mind that it's going to be more fluctuating and, and more volatile early in the season, and, and it just kind of calms down towards the end of the year. So just you got to keep that in mind. Don't think uh, any one any one movement of the pairwise after one game early in the season is is that's the story for the rest of the year. Just keep it all in context, and and just watch the games and have fun. Pairwise is just an extra little tidbit that you can follow along. So you know, what are the other questions that we got? Um since we're just on the subject, uh, Eric Zamora, um, the, the voice of the Norseman said, uh, how many NCHC teams get in? And that's kind of the big question, uh, right now when we're looking at it is, you know, we're just talking about who's the bigger dud so far this season. Is it North Dakota or Minnesota Duluth? I mean, right now it's not looking good for either of them. You know they they definitely have to make some moves. So, uh, what uh, what say you about how many teams get in? Uh, basically, if you were to pick over under at three, um, you know, are you saying over under or push? It's a good over under because I. That's the thing. I mean, right now I think thirty point five. I think, and I would think 2.5 even isn't. So that's why I got to go three. Usually I like the 0.5s for over under, but. I'm going to go push. I'm going to say right on three. Right now, I would say Denver and St. Cloud are pretty close to locks. 90%. I mean, we're kind of saying high 80s for St. Cloud, and I think even higher for Denver. But then Western, as we've mentioned, after that first weekend, that. Anchorage loss does not look good for them and that's going to potentially kill them. And so they're, they're certainly not a lock at this point, although I I do think they're a good team and I would not be surprised uh, if they make the tournament. Uh, But right now sitting at 20 in pairwise. So right now, just if, if the, if the field was picked today, we would just have Denver and St. Cloud in the field. Um, And so I do think that there's going to be another team here that's going to merge as an at-large 
And I wouldn't be surprised if there was an outside team that wins the tournament too. So I would say three or four. I, I don't think we're going to get two teams. I think there's going to be more than two. Okay. But where I got to think either. Where's Western right now in the pairwise? I'm looking at the app. And again, this is the CHN app. So mm-hmm. I, I, this might not be right, but I have them at 20 okay. at the app right now. So I, so. the reason I asked is because I just used the customizer for switching that Alaska Anchorage game. Yeah. Western Michigan would be at 13. Right. I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, and that's a little bit of early season volatility of the pairwise, but that, so that won't be the same in March, a seven slot difference. Yeah. But that could be a two or a three spot difference. And that might be the difference between them getting in and being out. So yeah, big, big loss for them. And but I got to think either one of Denver or uh, excuse me, one of Duluth or North Dakota is going to turn it around here. Um, and, 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 and in weird play, like we expected and them in to. weird pairwise fashion, uh, that switch puts us to three above Connecticut. Right. Cause it would have made <laughs> their win over Western look better yep. or our loss or our loss against Western not look as bad. Not look as bad. Yeah. In comparison. So, so yeah, uh, but I got to think, so I'll go. You're going three. And I'm not, I'm not sure what the third team is. Like, can't say Western for sure. And I can't say Duluth or Dakota for sure. I don't think Miami, Miami's not going to get in. CC's not going to get in. Omaha's not. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty confident that those teams aren't. But the other three... I, I think there's one one spot for those other three schools. And here's how I think it's going to happen. And I don't like to say this, but I'm going to. Dakota Dakota's going to win the uh, yeah. NCHC tournament? Yeah. Well, this would be a great year for North Dakota not to make the tournament because uh, they, they host a regional in Fargo. <laughs> It'd be great if they didn't make that. It'd be at least the second time that they haven't made their own regional. Yep. That was the infamous uh, ASC St. Cloud game. Uh, be great if uh, that place was green free. Um, so I'll be rooting for that scenario. It's always just nice to have them sit out a tournament. It'd be nice, frankly, it'd be nice to see Duluth sit out a <laughs> tournament. Would, would not mind that. Um, so, yeah, my, my dream scenario, I think, would be Denver, St. Cloud, and Western being the three. But I think that I, there's there's got to be, I think, maybe both Denver and Duluth have to kick it in high gear, and then Western also playing decent and maybe being a factor in the tournament to get four teams in. I, and I just don't have the I evidence don't, to, I don't see four. to make me believe that those teams are going to turn it around. Like I said, one of the two teams can turn it around. I, just, I don't know about both, so... but. We got the rest of the season to find out. Yeah, and just looking at the rest of kind of some of the other conferences, RIT sitting at ten and two on the season. Atlantic hockey yeah, gotta sneaking be the, two. Uh, I think they're a little bit down in the pairwise right now. Well, who else? RIT who else would be? Team. Who's the second? Who, you're getting ahead of yourselves. Who's the second Atlantic team that you like? Oh, whoever wins the tournament. I don't know. Atlantic hockey might. Sometimes it's well, RIT might win that tournament. Yeah, but like, what they got to be the odd, they got to be the odds on right now to. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they got to be the clubhouse leader. But then all of a sudden, and I am circling the, those games that they play against uh, Penn State. Really want them to take a game against them, right? No, I think it's this is going to be, I think, an East heavy tournament. Yep. Uh, right now. Minnesota State, the only team in the pairwise gate from the CCHA. Uh, as we're saying, NCHC might might just get three teams in. Big Ten's going to have a good year. As we mentioned, possible that they could get five teams in. Um, I would doubt that they're going to get that many, though, because Hockey East is having a very good year. Yeah. The thing with Hockey East that's that's weird that Whereas I think the NCHC is top heavy. Like you got Denver 
which I think is an elite team. And then even St. Cloud, like right now, is in a one seed position. They're at number four in pairwise. Big Ten, I think, is top heavy. You got some real high quality teams there. Minnesota, Michigan, and State, you can even lump them in there. With Hockey East, I don't think you have like a clear number one in that conference. But what you have is like six teams that are all going to be near the top. You just don't have a Denver-type team that's clearly separating themselves from the rest of the pack. But that might, that might help them get a more of a quantity of teams into the tournament. So, again, I don't know what their max would be. It's a 12-team conference. Or is it 11? 11. Um, so I definitely would think it's definitely possible for them to get five or six in, I would think. Um, so it'll... A lot of how, the, how much the NCHC will get in probably depends on how well Hockey East is doing. If they kind of keep it up, and if they sort of take care of the last chunk of non-conference here, that might help them sort of maybe get a sixth team in, which might prevent you know either a fifth Big Ten team in or maybe that third or fourth NCHC team to get in. So I do think that they're better than they have been in years past, Hockey East is, so... So that might be a, another factor in that uh, it, it, as well. Yeah, I feel like and it, you're, if you're if you're saying, if you're saying to, to fumble, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, or any of these teams. I mean, UConn. You got to be pretty confident on them right now, just based on if, if we're confident as for, from St. Cloud's perspective, UConn's even uh, been slightly better than them this year. So, got it. Looks looking good for them. But then you got you know Providence, Miramac. BU, UMass. UMass is really kind of buoyed by their sweep of Denver, and, and that's going to be sort of the opposite of Western losing to Anchorage. UMass is probably going to hang around, even though they're right about 500 right now, 6 5 and 1. But they're hanging around because of those two high quality wins against Denver. UMass Lowell is hanging around Northeastern at 17. So they got a lot of. A lot of quantity. I don't know if there's a team that is truly elite out of that group, but certainly got the quantity uh, of teams there. I should say, too, if you're saying, if you're giving up the ghost about everyone's going to... I'm fine with talking about pairwise. I definitely think that you've qualified yourself for that because you're already bringing up the pairwise editor feature from (laughs) CHN. Once you're bringing that up, it's officially pairwise season. (laughs) So, <laughs> so it was all a ruse. <laughs> I just was. Wa- I wanted was. to be old man yells at cloud. Well, and now it's like no nope, pairwise being... editor. Let's edit everything. Well, that that Western Anchorage game was going to be a game that I was going to play around with the predictor later in the year because I, I did that with uh, Omaha last year. With uh, I think they when they lost to uh, Miami and CC last year because they had a bunch of wins last year, but. Um, but they had some bad losses too. And if they, I think if they would have just lost or if they would have won just one of the games against Miami, it was like a two or a three spot jump just for that. So yeah, it's fun to, to tweak around with that tool, but, uh, usually I reserve that for later in the year, but we're whipping it out here already. Uh, pre Thanksgiving again, might as well. Pete Rose just head first. That's right. Let's you're going to do it. Let's go into it. Um, you know, as any um, results, I know we talked a little bit about some other the results um, from uh, from the weekend. We don't have a we don't have anything to to uh, preview. No preview, uh, yep. except our Thanksgiving feast, I guess, if you want to. But I think the food stuff may be already kind of played out. So, food's delicious. We'll just uh, move on from that. Um, so what did you see? I saw. Um, you know, most of uh, Thursday's uh, Michigan Minnesota illness bowl that they had. Yeah, might as well have a puke bucket right there on the on, on the side for everyone that was sick for that series. And then um, watched a little bit. You know, it was it was a good weekend for NCHC TV. Um, considering you had a a game out in the Eastern Time Zone, you had a Central, and you had a Mountain Time Zone, so you yeah. had everything stacked really really nice. So, um, any, anything else? Non-conference jumped out to you. Wisconsin survived Lindenwood. Um, so, uh, 
that uh, that that prediction uh, fell a little bit short, but uh, it was again quite the interesting uh, Lindenwood uh, experience with the own goal from. They the had start. a lead, had a lead in the third period, and uh-huh. coughed it up. Lindenwood uh-huh. did. That's Frustrating right. there. Uh, we got to. 300 minutes plus. Oh, 300 did minutes you get the plus? exact yes, I the did. exact time of, of Yale's scoreless streak? Uh, I was texting Weldy, and I'm sure I was the one that jinxed them, but they were on a they got a five on three uh, basically for a full two minutes. And uh, Cornell almost pulled it, uh, almost killed it off. It was like down to 20 seconds, but then Yale did end up scoring on that five on three and uh, got another goal. Uh, in that game against Cornell. Um, and then the following game against Colgate, back at it, uh, not in the shutout. They they were able to salvage a garbage time goal there to have an 8-1 to one loss at Colgate, a game where they were down 6 nothing and had four shots on goal through two periods. Um, the Colgate goal and the second Cornell goal for Yale in those games were even strength goals. Prior to that, they only had one even strength goal in the entire year. Two power play goals, one even strength goal, and then the four shutouts, and then the five on three goal. So we're at eight games played, six goals, one and seven on the year. This is not a good hockey team. This is. So, long story short, uh, they bad. Uh, 19 days, 4 hours, 1 minute, and 53 seconds between goals. Yeah, and... I bet you we got 20-plus games left. I mean, we got a, we got a full season here. New, I mean, uh, new streak starts now. Let's... let's right. <laughs> let's, 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 let's get yeah, to 20. Let's get to 20 days. That, uh, they scored with... Two minutes and 36 seconds left in the game against Colgate. So they're at 236 mm-hmm. of a scoreless streak mm-hmm. right now. So they only got 298 minutes to go <laughs> to, uh, to, to pass their own, their own streak. So keep an eye on that. Yeah, that Minnesota-Michigan game, I mean, great timing for the Gophers. Fantilli mm-hmm. is, is out for Michigan. They had like five guys out. They were suiting up a third string goalie as a forward during that game. You can tell there's a regime um, change there as well, considering that uh, Pearson would have tried to probably bow out of that game. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't think about that, but yeah, there's. Uh, yeah, I mean, they said it's virus related. I'm. I'm guessing that's not COVID because if it was, they would have said it was COVID. I, one guy was in the ICU, so it sounded pretty serious. Um, and, and Minnesota too, having some guys out as well, their goaltender was out. So sweeping them with their backup goalie, uh, pretty impressive, but that's one where it's just like, all right, it's perfect timing. I think for the Gophers to pop play them pop, at, at pop Yost. quiz. Can you, can you spell that goaltender's last name? So like Bartis Skavich or something. It, I got Bart. I, I get that part. B A R T. Yep, there you go. Um, don't give that one to the CCPA announcer. <laughs> well, I, I, don't you want to put that uh, as an answer in one of your crosswords? <laughs> Just yeah, swept Michigan. B A R T O S Z K I E W I C Z J F G. Yeah, it's like an I chart. <laughs> Uh, or just random letters here. Uh, it's a mouthful, mm. but uh, impressive for the Gophers. I saw so Michigan State salvaging a split with Penn State. Again, unexpected early season uh, one-two tilt in the Big Ten. Uh, although it's not one, they're not one-two anymore due to uh, Minnesota jumping them in the standings with that sweep. Um. Tight up at the top there, top three with Minnesota, Michigan oh. State, and Penn State. And you still got Ohio State is doing okay. Notre Dame's a weird team. Uh, they seem to be like the Duluth of the Big Ten. They had some expectations coming in this year, but not being able to score and kind of being blah. 
kind of like how Notre Dame hockey usually is. I guess it's not all that uh, shocking. And then Michigan sitting at six in the conference right now, but you know they got maybe the Hobie favorite on their team as long as he's not out for an extended period of time. So you can't count them out either. They got actually a decent series this weekend with Harvard coming in. Harvard undefeated at 7-0. Haven't played anybody, but uh, that'll be an interesting series. I hope that maybe I can catch a little bit of that. Yeah, I'm excited to see Harvard but, play somebody. Like, I've heard real- that they have heard that Harvard, a crazy stat that Harvard has the most draft picks of anyone in college hockey. They got 15 guys on the roster that's, that's drafted. I mean, Big Ten's been on, like locking down that stat for basically their history of a conference. You generally don't see, you don't think of Harvard as being no academic scholar or no uh, athletic scholarships. You don't anticipate them to have such a stacked prospect roster, but they have been in the past, and and yeah, they're an intriguing team that I would I wouldn't mind watching them against a, a formidable foe, uh, which I think Michigan would be this weekend. Consider at least if they're healthy. So that that should be an early season kind of a fun non conference series to uh, to keep an eye on. Harvard has thirteen draft picks. Okay, which is well, yeah, a lot more than I would have expected. I thought I, I thought it hurt. I thought it was fifteen, but uh, it was the CHN guys that said that they had the most of of any other team. I'll take their word for it. I'm, you can fact check that. That could be wrong, but uh, I got that from uh, from the CHN people who are never wrong. So I uh, Minnesota uh, has uh, bow bow to their. Well, maybe maybe they're just incorrect then. Um, it's it's very possible. It would make more sense. Well, I mean, their so mobile their more. mobile app is never wrong. So <laughs> it's true, true. I think we'll, bl- we'll just blame it on college hockey stats. Yeah, exactly. Being dead. The one guy retired, so, so just, therefore everything collapsed. Yeah. Right. Just erase what I just said. Harvard, <laughs> they only got a couple of draft picks. It's nothing to no trivia question. Nothing to write home about. But uh, yeah, Miami. Um, was able to yeah. hang on, I guess is lack of a better term against um, North Dakota on Saturday's game, which uh, kind of was the big shocker. Um, you know, I didn't see a lot of that game because uh, I was uh, not watching, you know, volleyball actually probably, but it was, um, you know, very handily, you know, UND in favor of the shots. But uh, Miami got up to a three nothing lead, um, you know, fairly early. So or early into the second period, you know, North Dakota obviously they were able to battle back, but Miami scores with about six minutes left to go to to kind of seal it. Yeah, first conference win for Miami, and you know, North Dakota waxing Miami seven to one the night before. It just, you know, this North Dakota team is a head scratcher, and I'm not complaining. Yep, I think I saw online that uh, they're out of the poll and um, Brown's out of the poll. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Uh, they're out of the poll, and um, UMD is out of the poll, and it's the first time both of those teams are out since 2014. <sighs> Don't give me an us show trivia question. <laughs> us show poll trivia question there. Boom. Just did. You're welcome. 2014, huh? Yeah. I suppose it's a little... so sneaky that D- Duluth has been good for that long. You know, like, remember, like, when Crandall was there, like, they were kind of just an average. <laughs> fifth place team. That's the kind of Duluth gotta, that I like. You got to um, remember. I mean, it's, you know, the poll is the top 20. There are 60 teams, so they're in the top third of college hockey. I mean, it's not. Well, I'm trying to think, too, because there was a couple of years that, that Dakota missed the tournament. Now, yeah. N- so so I'm sure going back to 2014, it's Duluth has been more consistently in the poll than Dakota is, which I, I don't think you would have thought that 10 years ago, let's say. But it's probably, yeah, it's, so it's it's probably the f- the fact of yeah, I'm just it's astounding that 
D- Duluth has basically been ranked for that long. But yeah, as you said, it's just a matter of uh, being in the top third. Yeah. So it's maybe not. And it's the Ustra poll, so you shouldn't. So, uh, I mean, they don't even respect Brown anymore. Cornell's back there, though. I did see that. <laughs> so. Um. Yeah, anything uh, LCCHA, uh, Mankato uh, dropped uh, one in overtime uh, to Northern Michigan uh, before you know, coming back on Saturday during that one. So um, this weekend, uh, you know, the Friendship Four in Belfast, North Ireland, with uh, Denmark, Quinnipiac, and UMass and Mass Lowell. So... Amherst and Lowell battle. They're 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 dra- they're they're flying a lot of miles for that game to take place. Really, that Dylan Amherst is playing that game. <laughs> God. And uh, it's a we- that's a weird. I mean, they they played that uh, that Northern Ireland tournament a couple of times. I don't think they have in a few years because of COVID. But mm-hmm. I, I know prior to that, they they went out there, and it's always again a, a random. Seemingly a random connect collection of teams. You'd think playing in Northern Ireland, maybe get a Boston team out there. Lowell is close to Boston, I suppose, but for I just don't who is I don't know how popular hockey is in that part mm. of the world. And I'm not sure if these are the collection of teams that are drawn people in. But I don't know if it's gonna be on ESPN plus. I'd I'd be cons- curious to check it out if it is. They are Hockey East and ECAC games, and those are the leagues that ESPN Plus is covering. So I, I guess I haven't checked. I could see if it's lined up to to stream, but I would be curious to check it out. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a it's a long road trip, and they play UMass and Lowell play the very next weekend at one of their buildings at one of their camp. I don't know if it's at UMass or Lowell, but uh, so they don't get a week off after that either. It's like right back at the grind. So. Uh, that would be, uh, I think, a fun trip, an interesting trip. Be interesting. Like, where, where else would be a like a fun international trip uh, to to play college hockey? Mm-hmm. Like, go to like, you know, maybe St. Cloud. They go to like a Finland friend, Finland for yeah, a fin, you know? a fr- uh, yeah, a Finland friendly. Kendrin Yami presents <laughs> the Finland face off <laughs> featuring. The Huskies. Uh, but let's get all the Huskies there. St. Cloud, UConn, Michigan Tech, and uh, Northeastern. The Friendship or the Helsinki Huskies. Like, if you had a yearly tournament Ho- with those four teams and you play after, like, a dog dish, like, a, like <laughs> this is, I think that would just be awesome. <laughs> Again, get trophies in college <laughs> hockey. Get, get, get the dog bowl. That'd be a... And it's not like it's unlike the Ooh. North Star Cup, whose who their problem was you had five teams to try to get into a four team tournament. So always one team had to sit out with the Huskies. You just got the four teams. So perfect math yeah. for a, a tournament. I, I think we should get this done. Let's let's uh, maybe shoot this one up the uh, flagpole. And give that one to the athletic director that we don't have. That, that uh, yeah, exactly. Now I I do feel like we could call it the dog bowl. That that'll be the name of the trophy. That'll be the name of the whole thing, and it could be right in the middle of the college football bowl season. So I mean, you can kind of play mm. off both things, and I, I think I think it's a winner idea. Maybe even rotate and you just like rotate just rotate it in, between the schools between the schools. Or, or are you thinking or are you thinking like a neutral site? No, I think just rotate it between the yeah, schools. I, Neutral, neutral site and college hockey. No, not, not a good, a good idea. idea. <laughs> <laughs> no. But uh, yeah, if you have a, no, I, I, th- I, th- I think uh, all four of those. I, I think it'd be. I, I think that's a winner. So I, I don't. Who says no? But I do think like, I don't know how this Northern Ireland thing came about, and it must be at least somewhat successful for them to do it multiple years. Um, but 
that kind of opens the possibility of, of where else to do it. And I, I do think Scandinavia is sort of the natural kind of place. If you, if you were looking to do that somewhere, it's not like you're going to go down to Chile and play a college hockey tournament. Like, wait, like Chile uh, bids on the next round of regionals. <laughs> and we had a, the Santiago region yeah. uh, hosted by Penn state. It's Hosted possible. Wisconsin. But, um, <laughs> it's Wisconsin and Alabama Huntsville. Right, exactly. So, so yeah, it's, it'd be fun. Yeah. It'd be fun to get some uh, international play. Um, One NCHC series here, Omaha at Denver. Um, Should be Denver easily taking care of those uh, games. But uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see what Omaha... Uh, and then, yeah, that North Dakota Bemidji State, that's, you know, I'll kind of have my eye on that one just because, you know, we played Bemidji, you know, one game we played, the other game we didn't really show up to. But A couple of other neutral site games, just one-offs, uh, the Madison Square Garden game, which Cornell is generally, I think they've always been a part of that, maybe... Once or twice they haven't been involved, but usually they are playing UConn this year. So UConn, an opportunity with a, I don't know, somewhat sexy game at Madison Square Garden in the Big Apple, see if they can continue their winning ways. And then you have another Nashville game. It must have went somewhat well last year when North Dakota and Penn State played. So deciding to do it again, but we're picking Western Michigan and Northeastern for some reason. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you're not going to get as good of a crowd this year. than you did last year with North Dakota playing. Um, But let's hope some of the Western Michigan fans and Northeastern fans for that matter, if they can make the trip down there. Odd. But maybe not as odd as playing in Northern Ireland, but still kind of a head scratcher why you got those two particular teams involved. But I don't shouldn't be a bad matchup. I mean, it's a rematch from their NCAA game from last year, so be an interesting, interesting matchup there. Well, we also the only other we have the Mayor's Cup, which is uh, the big tilt between Brown and Providence. So. You know, oh, we're yeah. all Team Brown oh, here on, on this, this year. the unofficial uh, Brown secondary cheerleading squad here at the Huskies Hockey Podcast. Yes. Minnesota at Arizona State. I mentioned to you earlier before the show, I guess. Uh, I, I'm trying. I'd love to go to one of those games. It's sold out and tickets are pretty pricey on the secondary market right now. So I'm. It might be a game day decision if I can get a ticket that's kind of cheap enough. I would love to go, but I'm not, I can't make the commitment. Or I can't call it for sure if I'm going to make it or not, but it would be, it would be nice to go to that one of those games. You had mentioned, you know, we're talking about the Merrimack schedule. They're again playing Tuesday uh, against Holy Cross. The Tuesday, Thursday, Monday, <laughs> Wednesday schedule for Merrimack's weird enough, but Again, playing at 4 p.m. Merrimack time on Tuesday. Like, I, I just, I don't, I don't understand. And the fact that it's all going back to Friday, Saturday after 2023 starts. I, I don't, I wouldn't imagine there's some sort of building facility issue. I, I just don't get just it. And the CHN, it. the CHN uh, podcast that, that I mentioned earlier one of the guys on it is like the Merrimack beat writer. And you'd think, I mean, he's, and he's brought it up too. Like, Oh, I love this schedule because that means I can watch a bunch of non-conference games. I can go to the games that I cover, but that's during these weird off times. So I can catch a lot of the other action, but he, I, I don't, he, he hasn't really explained why I, there just, there needs to be a, a reason here. I don't, I don't understand the times much less the days of the week. So but that'll give me an opportunity probably at work tomorrow to fire up some Miramac Holy Cross action there you go. Uh, during my break. 
So, I guess I'll cheer on the fact that I have that opportunity, but again, scratching my head as to why. Uh, well, we do have, granted, we will still have a show next week, uh, but, you know, that Tuesday tilt, that Connecticut Miramac game, I mean, that's penciled on my calendar, so. That's right. That's right. Um, you know, most of the questions, uh, we were able to, uh, answer throughout our uh banter here throughout the show um you know we talked about ncaa's tournament selection how many people how many teams we think we're going to be able to get in um alex fern question here uh do you think the team scores more or less shorthanded goals than last season now last season i don't know if you remember i did kind of jinx micah miller because i did predict he would have more shorthanded goals than oh man was it hardigan think so so i think that's what it was yep i think i think i went i think i went in on that that prediction too and and then i don't think he he scored another shorty after another shorty afterwards so you know alex you're really putting us on the spot here because uh i would imagine then you know it's if it doesn't work out then yeah it's clearly our fault but um you know last year we ended up with 10 right now we have five uh, with uh, on pace, with on pace to to, to with, best that with uh, uh, Brendan Bushy snipe. So not not many yeah, people we're gonna can get snipe a couple from more of those. Feet, so right, we can get a couple more of those two hoppers. Yeah. Um, maybe we will be able to to beat it. Uh, it's a, it's just it's a tough thing to to predict, but but I think be, because of guys like Miller, Brookshank. These are guys that have that that are you know that that'll play on the sh- uh, on the penalty kill and that have a history of doing this kind of thing. So I certainly would not be shocked if they surpass ten. Like I said, we're they're already halfway there and we're not halfway through the season yet. So do I go out on a limb and call it? Eh, it's it's hard. It's it's one of those things that's hard to predict, but. Hey, they're on pace, so I'll go with yeah. Let's I'll I'll say they get eleven. Yeah, and I bet you Miller will lead the way among the, the those goal scorers. And I think, I mean, if memory now I have to double check, but I believe Miller only has one this season. Um, I think that's right. Which, uh, you know, is a little bit surprising considering a how many he had last a weekend, but b how many chances I thought he's had as well. Um, well, that's the thing because I, I think it was last year when he scored like his first one or two. I'm just like, God, he just he does this every season, and I looked and he hadn't gotten any shorties prior to last year, which is like, what well, was mind boggling. I'm like, what? But the thing is, it's like every game he's got a shorthanded breakaway, it seems mm-hmm. like. Or like once every other game. He's just he has chances every single game, seemingly. So it's deceiving that he doesn't score more because of the amount of chances that he has. So that'll get that's that gives me the more reason or more optimism that they will break that ten mark this year, because if he's only got one shorty so far this year then yeah there's there's more in the bag i think this year for him yep and that um that one if i remember correctly that breakaway that was against western michigan um that brought the game within three to two that was yep during the five minute major yep exactly so that's and there's ways too that some of these like you can get like a shorty like with the, you know, as an empty net, oh, yeah. I mean, that's empty true. like you can get some cheap ones. <laughs> like they don't have to all be highlight reel type goals. Yeah. We Case just have to point, play with the uh, Brendan Bushy. <laughs> that's right. So. Yeah, the Bushy play, obviously that's not going to lead off sports center, but uh, it was a shorty. Crookshake, Cronulla, Miller, Bushy, and a Sean all have short the goals. Yeah, that's a good spread. So who are you going to cover when we're shorthanded? That's right. So uh, last season, four, like we said, for Miller, uh, Fitzgerald, Cronulla, Kupka, Trayball, Ludke, and Brand. 
pretty so, random assortment of players there. Yeah, exactly. So, um, and then last uh, question, uh, last couple of questions here uh, we had was about uh, World Cup as that kicked off today. Um, you know, I I enjoy soccer. Um, Andrew, are you even a big soccer fan? I guess I don't even know. If the bar is no, involved I, in soccer, are you in, uh, involved? Do you do you like? I could see myself. Yeah, I, I just have not been in that situation before. I, I've given soccer multi, you know, several chances. I've watched, I don't know, dozen games and big ones too, like the World Cup final or what is it, the UEFA. Um, I, I, it's not like I'm just watching random MLS games. Like I've, mm-hmm. I'm seeming if the ones that I'll watch are generally the the big the big ones. Sure. I just have never quite gotten into it i i feel like i just don't have the bandwidth anymore like i when i was young when i was like late 90s i was watching i watched every wolves game i watched every vikings game i watched every i was this was before wild even so i was watching all like the espn hockey games that that's they would a, put on there it's a lot of now losses. i'm just i'm i'm basically down to baseball and hockey like i i really don't follow football all that much don't don't really follow the nfl at all I, i'll follow college like i went to the Arizona football game this this past week, the first one of, of those that I've went to. But um but I only kind of dabble in, in, in that and I don't really follow basketball much. Again, I I'd like to make it like Arizona's right here in town, so mm-hmm. I, I do want to make it to one of their games, but don't follow it just as much as I just don't have the I just kind of narrow down my sports interests, you know, and I, I get really into baseball and I get really into hockey. Sure. And I think that's kind of the bandwidth that I have. So I, I don't, I'm not a huge soccer guy, but um, I'm sure I'll kind of come across the, uh, the results and, and follow it that way. But, um, but, uh, but yeah, I think the U S tied, they tied today, Wales, I believe as, as, as we're recording on, yeah. uh, on Monday. Yeah. They, uh, they, they dominated the first half and then, uh, second half was a little more in Wales and, you know, we were up one, nothing after the first, and then they got a, a penalty, penalty kick goal. Gareth Bale, who has won like everything, um, was able to, uh, convert on the penalty kick, make it one, one. And that was kind of like the big, like really for, you, you need a win, like a win and a tie really to kind of get out of the group stage at a minimum and this was kind of the one game was like okay if you win against wales and you know maybe a tie against iran and you're gonna lose against england it's kind of how people thought it was gonna go maybe a win against iran but that iran series is gonna or the game you know against iran they're gonna play wales and they're gonna play u.s you know those games are magnified so much i think england obviously was going to run away with the group even though they're not even really that good they're just i think a little bit better um than uh the united states as far as trying to get like hockey fans involved in it first off i think they've done a great job with um you know getting the premiership games over here and accessible on nbc and and getting those games you know, in, in front of people on Saturday morning and, you know, to treat it the way that they do, I thought was an excellent step because there is that huge skill difference between MLS and, um, you know, the top flights in the English, English premier La Liga, uh, league one, you know, anything along those lines. So it's, you know, I, I, I think it's just going to take time for, and we're starting to see more and more of Americans that are playing over in Europe. And I think just more success is going to take more eyes on it to get more people involved. And I think we're finally getting towards the right step. I do think MLS is doing a pretty good job. I think it could do a little bit better, but I don't know how everything is going to work out now that all of their games are going to be streaming next year. So on Apple TV, which is kind of, uh, you know, and it's a little bit pricey of a, of a, of a, of a program, but they're not doing any blackouts, which is nice. So 
Well, we'll kind of see how that shakes up. But I think the main thing that hurts MLS is that they don't have a relegation system like they do in Europe. You know, if they have a system where, you know, promotion and relegation, I think I think that would draw a lot more eyes. Um, you know, they just I think Europe kind of looks over at that league and be like, why are you like if you can't get kicked out of the league? What's the point of playing? <laughs> like, you know, who's going to be? it's the it's the Atlantic hockey of, of soccer. Yeah. Really. Um, a couple of questions. Um, you mentioned uh, ties. Uh, are ties and shootouts, how do ties and shootouts in the World Cup affect the pairwise? Okay. Um, and number yeah. two, and number two, you said that the U.S. is playing whales. I thought that we're playing people. <laughs> uh, I, I, thought, I thought you were going to go with, I thought we were playing a real country. Because <laughs> uh, both, I think, are acceptable. But, yeah, exactly. And, and, and Iran, yeah, I know there's a lot of running in soccer, <laughs> but... All right, that that's it for the dad jokes. And see. So. But do tell me off off air. Uh, explain the pairwise in, in the World Cup to me. Just give me the the primer for that. Yeah, well, it, that'd be that'd be helpful. It it has to do with the amount. It's of just the goals first game here, so can I look? Can I look at the pairwise? Scored after the World, the World stoppage time, but you know before the end whistle, they count double. So it can, and it's then it's like two thirds of a win. Is there like yep. a 55 45? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. So, so it's basically the same as college. Hockey. It's basically the same, but you know, we got to make sure that we win our comparisons over any, anyone. But anyway, I, I really butchered that ending on that. I'm sorry. Probably just best work on it. Yeah. Probably. Just, we can edit that out. Yeah, Magic of editing. Yeah, screw uh, probably just end the podcast now. Oh, that about does her uh, for this episode. Um, you know, of course, we don't have we a game to preview. We went just as long as we and, normally did. Yeah, we go just as yeah. long as we normally did. So. Babbling and babbling and babbling. <sighs> well, that's um, for uh, Wally and Andrew. Uh, thanks for listening. And until next time, go Huskies. Woo! Woo!